Well, Christians are weird. Amen. Okay. <laughs> like, I, I said that to say this. I, I was going to ask, have you ever heard anyone say that? Yeah. Christians are weird. Maybe you've even believed that at one point in your life or as someone in the row right now. You believe that, right? <laughs> Christians are weird. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, Christians can do weird things. Now, like, I only think it would be a Christian that would wear a shirt that would have, like, this representation on it. And if you have this shirt in your rack in your closet, I mean, no offense by it, I just mean, like, you know, only a Christian would wear something like that, right? Or only a Christian establishment known like a church would probably have this kind of slogan, you know, along the side of a road, like, I have a pew for you and, like... That kind of stuff can be seen as like, okay, that's kind of weird. Like, what does that mean, right? And I mean, if we're honest, there's a lot of weird things that are done often in the name of Jesus. And some of them are just kind of funky. Some of them are just kind of weird. But some things are weird in another sense that as believers, we kind of see life through a whole different set of spectacles. Does that make sense? We, we see and interpret things through a whole different lens, a, a biblical lens, the values that we have as believers, well, they may be interpreted or, or sensed as or felt like weird to those who don't know the Lord. And, and can I just say this? Can I, can I have your attention? That's okay. That, like, that's, that's, that's kind of as it should be. Like, we're, we're light, we're salt. We, we've kind of been called out of the world to be in the world, but not of the world, where it seems like the values, the likes, dislikes are just the same as those that live in the world. Does that make sense? Like Christians are weird. Like what would it, not just the Mayo shirt or just the pew for you kind of slogan, but like in the sense that we live differently. Like our values, our why is very different in life. We're living for the audience of a person to whom we will give account for. Not for salvation. Our salvation has been done and dealt with. Our sins have been forgiven. But we also recognize that everything we do, attitudes, choices, work ethic, it has value and meaning for eternity. We're living for the audience of one person, Jesus. We're not competing with one another. We're running a race that the Lord has for us. And he's the one that we'll give account to for everything. We're walking through the gospel of Mark. And as we're walking through the gospel of Mark, the setting that we're in in this text, Mark really focuses in on that last week of the life of Jesus before he goes to the cross. And we've seen so far in the last few months that account of Jesus riding into what city? Starts with a J, ends with an M, rhymes with Jerusalem. <laughs> what city is he riding into? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Riding into Jerusalem. Known as the triumphal entry. Jesus riding on a donkey. We've considered some of the events that have been happening in the life of Jesus as he's preaching, as he's teaching, as he's been encountering a lot of different dynamics. And this morning, in Mark 14, starting in verse 12, we're going to consider this account of Jesus just hours before he experiences that which he came for, to go to the cross and to rise again. And he'll initiate something that we'll discuss today and even partake of today, communion. And here's what I think we'll see. We're going to see that communion is not one of those things that you would chalk up as, well, that's weird, but it's truly wonderful. Truly wonderful. At the end of our time together this morning, it's my hope and my intention to share some things with you on, on the meaning and the impact of what we'll do today that I hope give you kind of a tangible opportunity to be renewed, to be refreshed, and to rejoice in who Jesus is through communion. But as our rhythm is, let, let's study through the text. Let's look at verse 12 in Mark chapter 14, and then we'll begin to walk through what the Lord has for us in his word this morning. I'm going to be reading and teaching from the New Living Translation, but let's look at verse 12. On the first day, Mark writes, of the festival of unleavened bread... When the Passover lamb is sacrificed, well, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? Now, Mark gives us the setting. 
It's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he tells us. This is a, a seven-day festival. Let me ask you a question. When you hear the word festival, do you see that as a, a somber, sobering, kind of quiet experience or, or a joyful remembrance? Which, which one? Joyful, yeah. That's the setting of this situation. There, it's the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread, but when the Passover lamb is sacrificed... You see, this week was meant to be, intended to be, and was for God's people a celebratory week to remember, to rejoice their exodus from bondage in Egypt all those years ago and to be reminded of God's deliverance. Think of like Thanksgiving for us. It's set aside as a day for an intended purpose to be thankful. Well, this festival of unleavened bread, seven days set aside to be thankful, to rejoice, to remember the reality that God saves. That's the text. That's the context. That's the setting of the situation. I don't know maybe if you can relate to this, but have you ever been released, so to speak, in a good way? You know, like out of a situation, financial challenge, a health challenge, a job, and I don't know, maybe there's some sense of like hopelessness and bewilderment and then to have it come to an end. That's like the mindset. That's the purpose behind this kind of festival. A whole week to celebrate what God had done. Brought them out of 400 years of bondage. Well, why do they call it this? Festival of Unleavened Bread. Well, God brought them out so suddenly that he told them not to even put leaven in their bread because they wouldn't have time for their bread to rise before their departure from Egypt. So for seven days, they remember this, like this suddenness of God's deliverance by not having any kind of leaven in their house, which often, if you know the Old Testament, was always representative, leaven, just a, also representative of sin, but also a reality of how powerful God works, that when he delivers, he can deliver in a moment. And they were reminded of this. And kind of as this festival begins, before it begins, there's Passover. We may ask, well, what's that? How is this different from the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Well, the name Passover, it kind of comes from that 10th plague that happened in the land of Egypt. Maybe you remember Sunday school, the book of Exodus. God set Israel free from their Egyptian captivity with an event called the Passover. It's found in Exodus chapter 12. And see, God had sent plague after plague upon Pharaoh and the land of Egypt to show forth his power and so that the Egyptian leaders would release his people. But Pharaoh wouldn't surrender. His heart just hardened. And he would not, he could not submit to God. And after nine plagues of judgment, God promised one last plague. And here's what happened. The word tells us that God sent the angel of death into the land, but mercifully passed over every home, every house that had the blood of a sacrificial lamb on the doorpost and on the sides of the door. And as promised, here's the reality. The judgment, it was severe. But all those who had the blood of the lamb, who covered their home, well, the angel of death passed over that home. Not for the Pharaoh, not for the Egyptians. Their firstborn male child died. And it was then and only then that Pharaoh finally bent his knee, finally released the people for them to leave. And, and this is a tremendously significant event for God's people. God delivered them. And every year Israel would, would celebrate and be reminded through the festival of unleavened bread through the Passover with you know, like specific symbolic foods of who God is and what he can do. Are you getting the setting of what's happening with Jesus and his disciples? It's, it's celebratory. There's lots to be reminded of, lots of history. Passover comes first, and then there's these seven days known as a festival of celebration where, where they're, they're realizing and remembering that God saves, but it comes at great cost. The blood of a lamb had to cover the people for death to pass over them. 
And at the moment of our text, Jesus is in Jerusalem and hundreds, if not thousands of other families have crowded into this city to celebrate Jerusalem Passover. Why? Because that is where Passover had to be celebrated in the walls of Jerusalem. And Passover was a, a family celebration, it was something you did in a very intimate setting. And, and although some of the disciples were married, they kind of expected and assumed that they would celebrate this feast with Jesus as a family. So as Mark records for us, Jesus' disciples asked him, hey, hey, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? And we know from other accounts like Luke's gospel that this is something that Jesus intentionally was looking forward to doing with his disciples. And since the lambs were sacrificed on Thursday afternoon, well, the meal occurred that night. And so the disciples, they asked Jesus, hey, where should we prepare everything? And look with me at Jesus' response in verse 13. Mark tells us, so Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. And at the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where's the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He'll take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. And that is where you should prepare our meal. So Mark says in verse 16, the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus has said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. Now, obviously, Jesus had made some arrangements. He was ready for their questions. We don't know if he made these arrangements in a way that was just practical or supernatural. Say, what do you mean? Well, did he go to the owner of the house ahead of time, make arrangements for that evening, give him a code word, the teacher asks, and then the owner would do everything that was needed to prepare? I don't know. Was it supernatural? We've seen Jesus work this way before, right? Remember Mark 11? Remember this account? Let me read it to you from verse 1. Speaking of Jesus, it says in Mark 11 that he sent his two disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter, you'll find a colt tied there, on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it, bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. And they went away, Mark tells us. They found the colt tied outside the street, and they untied it. What's happening here in Mark 14? Is this something that Jesus just kind of set up ahead of time? Is this something that he does supernaturally? I don't know, but I do know this. It does show to us a truth that I hope is settled in your souls, that ultimately Jesus is in control. Everything that's happening here, remember what Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. The cross was not an afterthought. It was something that was ordained by God to accomplish our salvation. And the account written by Luke tells us that these two disciples here, they were Peter and John. And Peter and John went, as Jesus told them to do, to look for a man carrying a pitcher of water. Now, that would have been an easy thing to spot in that day. You say, why? Well, because men, if they were carrying any kind of liquid in that culture in a public, they would, they would carry it kind of in wineskins. A man carrying a pitcher of water would be out of place. It would be like seeing something today of a man carrying like a bedazzled purse, right? Like, unfortunately, in our culture, maybe that wouldn't be so obvious. But like, <laughs> like in that culture, you'd go, oh, okay, that's not the normal way. Like, that's, that, that's what they would, okay, I see that. That's the guy, right? Well, they were to follow him and say to the owner, the teacher wants to know where his room is. Why all this secrecy? Well, here's what's interesting. By keeping this location secret, Jesus delayed Judas's betrayal until after the meal. Jesus was going to the cross for sure, but he intentionally wanted to make a point to celebrate Passover with his disciples before he went to the cross. You see, Judas, we know just from here in Mark 14, if you look at verse, verse 10, it says that Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to betray Jesus to them. And they were glad 
delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Jesus and his disciples, they often stayed in the Garden of Gethsemane during festivals and feasts. Judas would know that location easily. In fact, that's where he'll ultimately be betrayed. But he had no knowledge of this upper room. So he couldn't betray Jesus there. Well, Peter and John, they get everything set up. And look what it says in Mark 14, verse 17. It says, in the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. And as they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. One of you eating with me here will betray me. And greatly distressed, each one of them kind of in turn asked, am, am I the one? And he replied, it is one of you 12 who is eating from this bowl with me. Now get to the scene. The disciples are enjoying a Passover meal, a Seder meal with their Lord. And at that time, sharing a meal was a tremendous sign of intimacy, relationship, friendship. We know that they were all kind of reclining at the table together, kind of in a very a casual but very close setting. Like often you may think of this setting like Leonardo da Vinci did, like with this painting. It doesn't necessarily this kind of scene where everyone's Caucasian sitting around a table with a tablecloth. It almost looks like they even just have each little roll kind of placed perfectly. You know, this obviously isn't a, a, a photograph, but this next slide will show you more kind of like what it would have been like. Like sitting around a rustic table, they're, they're kind of reclining. That would have been the culture of that day. I don't know, I'm thankful for progression. I like seats at a table, I like that. But this would have been kind of the setting of the scene as Jesus is sharing these words. And in the midst of this meal, remember this is not like meant to be a somber kind of experience. It's celebratory. Remember what God did, remember that he delivers. And then Jesus says, one of you will betray me, who's eating with me, eating with us. He shocks them by saying, one of you, not a true friend, one of you is going to betray. And Mark records for us that each one of them went around the table. Am I the one? And here's what's kind of crazy. They began in the midst of this to argue with one another about who is the greatest. Th thus, like the least likely to do this. Listen to how Luke kind of records this. He says in Luke 22, 23, they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this. And there also arose a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. I mean, I feel bad for Jesus in this moment. Like on a human level. But like he's there, he's intentionally wanting to celebrate this time with his disciples. And they're arguing amongst one another. Verse 20, he says, it's, it's one of you 12 who's eating from this bowl with me. And in this meal, this Seder style supper, portions of unleavened bread are dipped in kind of various foods. And we know from John's gospel, his account, Peter and John are there, and we can read from John 13 that, that Peter kind of motions to John, gets him to ask, who's he talking about? And listen to how John records this in John 13. Jesus answered, that it is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So he dipped the morsel, took it, and then gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. And Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. This is a somber scene. You've got to imagine the, like the, the moment of anticipation as Jesus reaches out and dips that morsel and then hands it to Judas. And he simply says, what you do, do quickly. Here's what I find even more astounding. No one in that little room, that upper room, assumed or thought that Judas was the one to do this. They kind of even misinterpreted what happened in the moment. John records for us, continuing on in chapter 13, he says this, 
Now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he said this to him. Some were supposing because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. They thought Jesus was just giving Judas kind of an errand to do. He was a trusted guy, the guy you trust with the money. No one would have suggested Judas. He held the money back. But I want you to note this. Judas's temptation started with the desire for earthly things. And it ended with Satan entering his life. He, he gave him an open door into his life through what? Greed. Greed. It's not wrong to have material things. In fact, God will bless some of us with material things, with resource, with, with money. But here is one of the strongest New Testament's calls in relationship to the temperature of our heart. Beware of the love of money because it is the root of all evil. This is where Judas is. Went after money and fell away from the Lord. Satan entered in. And what does Jesus do? He, he continues to extend friendship to Judas even until the very end. A few times during the meal, Jesus mentions that someone's going to betray him. In John 13, Jesus made mention that, man, when he was even washing their feet, Mark doesn't record this at this point. But in John's gospel, we know that Jesus took time to wash the feet of the disciples. And he, Jesus said this, now you are clean, but not all of you. One of you is going to betray me. Do you see gentle Jesus in this moment, still kind of wooing through kindness, Judas to repentance? It's like he's saying, Judas, I, I know your heart, but change your mind. And Jesus passed that morsel of bread, of food, to Judas at the table that night. It means that he was in close proximity to Judas. We know from another account that John was on one side of him. It seems like Judas was right there next to him. And Jesus is still extending friendship to Judas. You know, there's a prophecy about this in, in Psalm 41.9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. The Lord is so full of compassion. He even still calls him his friend. And like the father of a prodigal son, the Lord was waiting for Judas to change his heart. And it's interesting. Throughout Scripture, you constantly see this theme in the Old and New Testament. This, this concept of God's sovereignty and still our responsibility. Say, so what do you mean? Look at verse 21. In, the, in this moment that's tense, verse 21, Jesus says, For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But, but how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he'd never been born. Jesus was going to be betrayed and crucified. It's going to happen, but Jesus says, woe to the man, woe to the man by which it comes. See, in that day, in most of Judaism, it was just embraced and believed in this reality of both God's sovereignty and also human responsibility. This is the biblical view. This is the view of Christianity. I mean, with regards to salvation, our lives, there's this interplay of God's sovereignty and also our responsibility. They're inseparable. I mean, elsewhere in the word, in the book of Acts, let me read this to you as, as Peter is sharing. He says this, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, God's sovereignty, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless man and put him to death. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Did, did you catch that? 
that, that Jesus was delivered up according to God's plan. And also in the same breath, and this man you nailed to the cross. It was God's plan to send Jesus. But at the same time, they were responsible for nailing him to the cross. That, that's why Peter says, let all the house of Israel know that God has made him both Lord and Christ, the Jesus whom you crucified. And then he calls him to repent. You know, in the Old Testament, there's this beautiful Psalm, Psalm 139, that says this. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not even one of them. God's in control. Now here's the deal. Don't allow this reality of who God is cause you to fall into a sense of fatalism. You say, what do you mean? Well, God's going to do whatever God's going to do. Listen, how God interacts with you and me, it's a mystery. Our days are ordained. They're written. But there's also human responsibility and free will. And part of the sovereignty of God is that he chooses to give you and I this ability to choose. These things interact. They intersect with one another all throughout Scripture. Think of what Paul writes to Christians in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. What? That we should walk in them. There it is. The sovereign plan of God. He's prepared good things for us that we should walk in. Means that some won't. And the sovereignty of God is that he's laid out these good things for us and given us this opportunity to choose to follow or to choose to not. And it's a mystery. But, but where else do we see it more played out right in front of our faces than in this story with Judas right before Jesus? Judas chose to betray him. And he bore the responsibility of that betrayal. It's like Jesus said, it would have been better if he had never been born. He doesn't say, I wish he would have never been born. No. It's just that the consequences of his choices, it would have been better. And Mark's emphasis here is that a friend is betraying Jesus. And this kind of goes throughout the rest of this chapter because Jesus, as we'll see, he, he even predicts that the disciples will deny and desert him. But even still, with betrayal, deserting, denying, Jesus, he institutes this thing that we're going to take this morning, this new meal for everyone, and, and shows how powerful he is as a savior and a friend who will never betray us. Never desert us, never deny us. And listen, this is the backdrop of what we're going to do this morning as we take communion. We all come with shortcomings. Can anyone agree with that? Amen. We all come flawed and failed. And Jesus still is there with arms wide open. Amen. He gives grace to those who don't always honor him as they should. He loves us. I mean, look at verse 22. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, look at what he says in verse 24. This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. And I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it in the new kingdom of God. They're all eating the Passover meal, something they've done probably since they were little kids. Jesus does something out of the ordinary. See, a normal Passover ceremony would have begun with kind of a, a blessing over the group. And they would drink from the first cup of wine. 
And then there was kind of like this tradition. I don't know if you have traditions in your home when it comes to certain holidays that you do certain things. Like, but in the tradition of Passover, the youngest in the group, be it a young child or just the youngest person in presence, would have this line they would ask. Why is this night different from other nights? And then the host or the dad in this situation, Jesus, would then retell the events of the Passover that happened in Exodus. And in recounting the things that were on the table, the elements that were on the table, they'd be explained. The lamb was there and it was eaten because the blood of the lamb was put on the doorposts that saved them. Unleavened bread would be a part of this ceremony because of their deliverance happened so sudden that God said, don't even put leaven into your bread. There'd be a bowl of salt water because of the tears that were shed in those years of slavery. Bitter herbs would be there because God rescued them from years of bitter living. And there would be four cups of wine on the table with four promises that God would bring them out of Egypt, that he would deliver them from the Egyptians, that he would redeem them with great acts of judgment and that he would take them to become his people. And in this scene, after they're reliving kind of the original Passover in this way, they would drink the second cup and then the meal would begin. And then before they drank the third cup, bread was broken. And here's what happens. Jesus in that moment changes everything. The whole course gives a whole new direction. After blessing the bread, it says he broke it and he said, now take, this is my body. And he gave them a cup. They drank of it and said, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many. See, this is earth shattering for these disciples. There they are kind of ready to celebrate and remember the Passover lamb of the past, an annual reminder of God's redemption of the Israel out of Egypt. And then Jesus speaks about his blood of the covenant. And in this meal, the, the, the bread no longer reminds them of past deliverance, but now it's reflective of what Jesus has done. And the blood meant to signify the, the blood on the doorpost now it brings in a whole new life. And it's interesting, as a church, as the church, we don't necessarily have a variety of feasts and festivals and ceremonies that ancient Israel did. We're not a, not a physical nation, but a spiritual people group. But there are two ceremonies that Jesus left the church with, baptism and communion. And in communion, we receive so much as believers. And as we close this morning, here's what I'd like to do. Before we come to the table to, to receive communion, I want to share with you 10 things. You say, oh my goodness, I thought we were done. You got 10 more points? Well, as I was thinking through and preparing for this, I came across a sermon from a friend of mine named Pastor Nate. And Pastor Nate shared 10 takeaways that I think are so helpful for us as we prepare our hearts for communion. And I wanna share them with you. We'll even put them up on the screen. Here's the first one. Communion, it reminds us of the incarnation. You say, what does that mean? As we hold the bread in our hands, we remember that God sent his son Jesus in bodily form. He became one of us. He, he took on flesh. C.S. Lewis has this famous quote, the son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. See, he knows us because he became one of us. One of the things that communion should remind us of, remember the setting of the first Passover meal that these guys would be celebrating was to remember what God did in Egypt that he delivered. As we take communion today as believers, I want you to be reminded of this verse. It comes from Hebrews chapter four. We do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with us, unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. When you hold the bread this morning, you're reminded that God stepped into humanity so that he could, among many other things, he can resonate with you. He knows what it feels like to be betrayed, to be lied about, to feel lonely, 
God loves us so much that he was willing to experience the worst that lies have to offer so that he could be connected to us. Yes, he came to die. Yes, he came to deliver. But also he came to be present with us so that we could have what the, what the psalmist would say, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's who Jesus is. Communion reminds us of the fact that God became a man, that he's not some distant deity, someone who just wound up the universe and is just kind of letting it play out. But he became one of us. But communion also centers us upon another big word. What? The atonement. Jesus came to entertain us, right? Jesus came to teach us. Well, Jesus came to die for us. Without him, our only chance before God to have a relationship is to keep his perfect law. Possible or impossible? Which camp would you land? Impossible. God is holy, sinless perfection. And as such, he must be holy in his judgment. Apart from Jesus, we're all destined for judgment. Amen. But God sent his son Jesus so that his blood could cover us. He atoned for our sin. Communion reminds us of that. But communion also shows us the importance of personal faith, right? He says, take, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. This is a very personal decision. Will I partake of him? The bread has to be eaten. The wine has to be taken in. No one can force you to partake, but you must decide. That's how faith operates. No one can force you to be born again. You personally receive him. See, communion reminds us that God stepped into our humanity, that he atoned for our sin, that there's that design of a personal relationship. But, but number four, it also communicates that the unity of the church, this is where it is. It's about Jesus. Why do we have fellowship with one another? It's not centered around LSU or Bama or Auburn or whatever that is, right? Our fellowship is about Jesus, who he is, what he's done. We eat from the same bread, take from the same cup. Who Jesus is and what he's done, that's where unity is found for brothers and sisters in Christ. But also communion reminds us that we belong to Jesus. We belong to him. Passover was meant to be celebrated inside a house with your own household of no more of like than 10 people or so. So when Jesus sat with his disciples in that upper room, it's kind of this dynamic that's being communicated. They're a part of his household and we belong to him because of what Jesus has done. Communion is meant to be a tasty reminder of that. And then I belong to Jesus. Communion gives us a chance to glory in the new covenant. What do you mean? So many people, I think, kind of live in this mindset of guilt-ridden obedience. And that's the old covenant relationship with God. This dynamic that, well, I've broke, broke his commandments again. I'm under great condemnation. The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that if we are in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are covered by him. Do you have sin? Have you made mistakes? Do you have areas where you don't measure up? Well, get right or get left. No, he is right. It's his righteousness. And I'm coming under him and he forgives. And that's why I don't get left. It has nothing to do with white knuckled obedience in following Jesus. It has everything to do with a heart that's changed by his grace and his love. And that kind of obedience, where you want to walk with him, he changes you from the inside out. That's what communion reminds us. Jesus, your blood is forgiven. Your grace is sufficient. But communion also, 
reminds us that Christ is our head. You say, what do you mean by that? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 says that Jesus is the leader of the church. It's his body. Colossians 1.18 says he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning. When we take communion, we're reminded that he is Lord. He is our shepherd. What he says goes. Communion also for us as believers, just three more things, kind of reminds us of our purpose, right? Of our mission. He told the disciples to go into all nations and make disciples. And as we hold the bread, as we hold the cup, we're reminded of this beautiful, simple, but powerful truth that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. And he's called us to partner with him to share this simple but beautiful message. Communion, though, it also offers an opportunity for self-reflection. Like 1 Corinthians 11, let each person examine themselves. It's not something to be done flippantly, but almost in a, in a sacred way. A holy opportunity to say, Lord, look what you've done. I, I want to live righteously before you. Opportunity to confess before him. And lastly, I would say this, communion stirs our hope for the second coming. I love that. Jesus said, I will not drink this cup again until the day I drink it in the new kingdom of God. I love these 10 things that Pastor Nate shares. If there's one or two that resonate with you this morning as we take communion together, I hope they'll remind you of how good, how gracious, how faithful God is to us. And as we take communion this morning, that in a fresh way, we do it with thankfulness and gratefulness for who Jesus is. Because the greatest truth of the gospel is this. God so loved the world that he gave his son for you. So this morning, as we take communion, I pray that that can be in a way that's celebratory. Because Jesus is coming back again. The communion reminds us of that. That he, he's kind of waiting to take that cup, that fourth and final cup of Passover, I guess you could say as it were, until he does it with us forevermore.